and this is actually part of the overall history of the Palestinian people that I don't think enough Americans know about. The Palestinian people have been in profoundly victimized by their Arab allies. If you go back through the history of the Israeli-Arab conflicts, the Palestinians have always been treated incredibly poorly by their Arab allies. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Clarissa Mall, producer of The Bulletin. Today on The Bulletin, hosts Russell Moore and Nicole Martin are joined by New York Times columnist David French to talk about the complicated crisis in Gaza, who's at fault, and where a path forward might exist. Next, we're discussing the recent re-election of Vladimir Putin and its implications for the West. Finally, theologian David Taylor joins the show to talk about the Psalms in seasons of conflict, why they're more than we have imagined, and how they can encourage us as we read the news and head into Holy Week. If you haven't already, visit us at morect.com bulletin to take our survey and give us your thoughts on the show. We appreciate your feedback. Now, on to today's show. Welcome to The Bulletin. I'm Russell Moore, Editor-in-Chief at Christianity Today. We have Nicole Martin with us today. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Russell. And my friend David French, who's right down the road here in Tennessee, who is, of course, columnist at The New York Times and is writing about a thousand different things every single week. Thanks for being here, David. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Russell. I'm really happy to be here. I thought over the past couple of weeks about an incident that happened with the governor of my state back in the day before I was born, a notorious figure by the name of Ross Barnett, who addressed one of the few synagogues in the state of Mississippi back in the 50s or 60s and said how great it was to be among people with such warm Christian fellowship without even recognizing what he had said, because there was a hot mic that picked up President Biden after the State of the Union talking to some members of Congress and saying, I told Bibi Netanyahu we're going to have a come to Jesus moment about- Poor choice of words. Poor choice of word about the conduct of the war in Gaza, but I think even if the wording was a little not quite right, it made the point. There's a real question as to what is going to happen in Gaza, especially when we have the ongoing issues of potential starvation in Gaza, and now we have the pushing of an invasion of Rafa that is straining relationship with the United States as well as the already strained relationships with the European Union and others. David, you were on here a while back talking about rules of engagement and how we ought to think about warfare going on. Has anything changed it's really hard to say. The circumstances on the ground have changed a lot. Uh, when we first talked about the war, the Israelis were just beginning their counteroffensive. At this point, Israel is in control of much of Gaza. Hamas has been reduced to clinging on to corners of the Gaza Strip. But what has changed is the death toll. There are now north of, if you believe the numbers that come from the Palestinian officials, which are Hamas in Gaza, if you believe those numbers, you're now looking at 30,000 deaths now. Do you believe those numbers? I probably believe the total. I don't believe the way that Hamas breaks down the difference between civilians and Hamas fighters. So we do know there's a very high civilian death toll. We also know there is a high death toll amongst Hamas fighters. We don't know the mix of that. So it's really hard to say what is the ratio of civilian deaths to deaths of Hamas fighters. And this is not unusual. To this day, people argue about the battle for Mosul in 2017 and how many civilians were killed versus ISIS fighters. That's still a topic of debate now. So we may never fully know the answer to that question. But the thing that has changed is the death toll is really high, and the humanitarian crisis is very real. And so that, from a law of war standpoint, isn't all that relevant unless there's solid evidence that Israel has violated the laws of war, which it's really hard to know that. 
And the death toll doesn't tell us that. It's very hard to know that without knowing the targeting decisions on a strike-by-strike basis. But even if the laws of war haven't been violated, the staggering death toll changes the geopolitical framework under which Israel is operating. And this is nothing new, by the way. Israel has always conducted its military operations with a clock ticking. In war after war, Israel has to accomplish its military objectives in a relatively short amount of time before the international community rallies against it. And ultimately, America historically has said, okay, enough is enough. And the question is, are we reaching that point? And are we reaching that point before Israel has reached its military objectives? How much do you think domestic politics in the United States plays into this? I think it's playing a not insignificant role. However, it's really hard to trace that specifically because Biden's coalition here is split. He has a lot of young people on the left who are more sympathetic to Palestinians, but he also has an enormous number of Jewish supporters who are not just outraged, obviously, as anyone should be by the Hamas attack itself, but they're also utterly appalled at much of the behavior they're seeing on the far left here in the United States. And so Biden is in a very tough situation. If he continues to give Netanyahu as free a hand as he's given him so far, he's going to continue to anger some of the far left young folks in the Democratic base. But if he doesn't allow Netanyahu or tries to restrain Netanyahu from finishing off Hamas as a military and political entity, then he may very well anger other elements of his coalition. Because the Democrats are They're a coalition party right now. They're not as much of a purely ideological party. They're a coalition party, and parts of their coalition are at odds here in this conflict. And so it really is difficult to say what's better or worse for Joe Biden, because if he he turns decisively against Israel's military operation, what will that do to other parts of his base? Nicole, do you think that in churches specifically— We have become exhausted in even thinking about or praying about these issues that happen overseas because there are so many of them and because it seems like we know far more than we've ever known before, and yet we know far less because of the influx of information. How do you advise people to even start praying about your kingdom come when it relates to things like this? Yeah, that is such a great question. I feel in instances like these, it's not a cop-out, but it's a truth that it really depends on the church. I have been even this week in settings with Christian leaders and pastors who feel that the justice issues pervasive across the world, and in particular in what's happening in Gaza, call us to an urgency of prayer. We must pray. And again, depending on the church, it They're praying in a particular direction. In other cases, there are some pastors that I've talked to who have said there will always be wars and rumors of wars until Jesus comes back. So let's just lump all of these things into the category of Jesus is coming back. Therefore, stay in your individualistic piety vein, do your prayer, your Bible reading. I think I wrestle with what feels very unique about the situation with Gaza it feels like an inability to separate the wheat from the tare when it comes to Hamas and Palestine. There are some people who feel very passionately about Biden and this administration not showing the level of compassion that is necessary for Palestinians. How can you effectively show compassion when you have an enemy, almost like ISIS, whose tactic is to infuse itself within civilians so that you don't know which way to go. And even take the war piece out of it for just a minute. When it comes to even humanitarian aid, how do we figure out how to do that to get aid to Gazans who are starving and who are helpless when Hamas seems to control all of that? Is there a way to do that? Or do we have to say, well, just as there will always be wars and rumors of wars, the poor will always be with us, which is not the context of the biblical quotation of that. But a lot of people have that sort of, "Eh, what can you do? 
I don't know what what can be done right now. With Biden's proposal of creating an offshore pier that can be a place where an enormous amount of humanitarian aid can come through is risky, but it's also raises a level of hope because one of the big issues has been, look, everyone's focusing on Israel only. Egypt hasn't exactly yeah. been very cooperative in assisting Gazans and Egypt shares a border with Gaza. So there should not be exclusive focus on Israel, but Egypt doesn't want Gazan refugees into its territory. And this is actually part of the overall history of the Palestinian people that I don't think enough Americans know about. The Palestinian people have been profoundly victimized by their Arab allies. If you go back through the history of the Israeli-Arab conflicts, the Palestinians have always been treated incredibly poorly by their Arab allies. After the Arab nations lost in their bid to try to snuff out Israel in the War of Independence in the 1940s, then they came in. Jordan occupied the West Bank. Egypt occupied Gaza. They didn't give that to the Palestinians. They took it for themselves. And then when refugees have left Israel or have left the West Bank and come into these societies, a lot of these Arab countries have not integrated Palestinian refugees into their society in the way that, for example, we integrate refugees into our society. They sort of left them in a permanent second-class citizen status, and then they've turned around and blamed Israel for all of the suffering of the Palestinian people, which is completely wrong. And so I have an enormous amount of sympathy for the Palestinian people, I also don't blame Israel alone for this. And this is one of the reasons why Biden has bad options. Egypt isn't really a partner here. <laughs> and so that offshore pier at least has a chance to bring in meaningful amounts of aid. But the bottom line is it's going to be very hard to protect the civilian population so long as hostilities persist. And by the way, who is it that rejected the last ceasefire offer? It was Hamas. Hamas rejected the last ceasefire offer. I wish people could understand that war often presents even just combatants with impossibly difficult decisions because Israel has an obligation to protect its citizens against Hamas. This is why governments exist. This is why militaries exist, is to protect their citizens from enemies. So they have that obligation. So they can't just say, we'll leave Hamas as a viable military entity after all they did to their innocent civilians, but then at the same time, Israel has both legal and moral responsibilities to protect as many civilians as possible. And sometimes those two imperatives are very difficult to harmonize. These are hard things. And so one of the easiest ways that I know I'm talking to somebody who doesn't really know what they're talking about the Middle East is when they say, I know the answer. <laughs> I think I texted you, David, uh, the other day, Jared Kushner, saying, let's just clear the Gazans out and put condos, <laughs> which I thought was an oh Indian headline, yeah. but it was actually real news. So. Yeah, it's it really is extremely difficult. And look, I am not one to say in any way, shape, or form that Israel is perfect, that Israel always gets things right. I have a lot of problems with their actions in the West Bank, the way the settler movement is moving through the West Bank. I've got a lot of problems with that. I think there are real issues. But Hamas, Nicole, as you said, his, is ISIS. Hamas is morally equivalent to ISIS. And Israel has very little choice but to diminish Hamas as much as it possibly can so that it cannot ever rise up and attack again, and also diminish it in a way that no one from the outside looking in says, Hamas won this war. And that is very important because this idea, if the October 7th goes down in history in the Middle East as a Palestinian victory, that's very bad for Israel because it will cause others to see, believe that they can emulate that action, that they, if they can kill Israeli civilians and still survive. But if Hamas is largely squashed as a result of this, then the message is when you go after Israeli civilians, you will not survive as an entity. And I think that from a standpoint of Israeli deterrence, they kind of have to crush Hamas as much as is feasible, consistent with the laws of war. That's basically their only truly viable option to restore deterrence. Chuck Schumer created quite a bit of controversy this week, Senate Majority Leader, by saying that Benjamin Netanyahu should leave, that there should be a transition in the Israeli government. And certainly that's one of the complicating factors when you look at an arguably 
ethically tarnished, arguably politically failed leader and inarguably very unpopular leader, both with his own people and around the world in Israel, you can see the way that the people of Israel probably said, okay, we've got internal issues, but we're not going to fight them now. We're going to fight this war. But it seems as though this might be a problem now. And there are a lot of Israelis and others who said, kind of like a family, we can talk about what's going on with Uncle Ronnie, but you can't. Was, was Schumer right to do this? I don't believe so. But we have a situation where we have an ideal world and a real world. And in the ideal world, I don't think what the Senate majority leader should be doing that now, especially because actually foreign policy is much more the province of the president and the secretary of state and the state department than it is the Senate majority leader. Although obviously Senate majority leader can be in communication with the White House and perhaps there's some coordination here. I don't know that there is, but it's conceivable. But ideally, we're not to be meddling in the elections of our democratic allies. But also our democratic allies are ideally not to be involved in ours as well. And BB comes to this issue with very unclean hands. <laughs> During the Obama administration, Netanyahu very notoriously defied Obama, spoke to Congress at Republican invitation. This was not the normal diplomatic protocol at all. And there was obvious efforts to put pressure on Netanyahu, made obvious efforts to create domestic political pressure on Barack Obama in America. And there is this interesting relationship between the United States and Israel where the two countries are very closely linked geopolitically, very closely linked culturally, very closely linked religiously, and also honestly quite closely linked politically. Politics in Israel matters to the U.S., and politics in the U.S. really matters to Israel. So, yeah, the answer is, ideally, I don't think so. But also, I recognize that due to the unique nature of the relationship between the United States and Israel, I fear that ship sailed. <laughs> and that ship may have sailed decades ago. The role of America in Israeli national security and the role of Israeli national security in American politics is unlike anything else involving any other country in the world, except arguably Great Britain, but there's no looming threat to British security. What we are seeing is the first, what I would call, serious test to the American-led global order since the fall of the Soviet Union. We have had attacks on the U.S., 9-11, obviously, but al-Qaeda never had the ability or capacity to really threaten to upend the global order. It could hurt us, obviously. Al-Qaeda could hurt us deeply, but it could never challenge overall our power in the rest of the world. It couldn't really challenge our NATO alliance. In fact, 9-11 created – NATO rallied to our side in, after 9-11. Al-Qaeda actually strengthened our NATO alliance. So al-Qaeda was dangerous in the sense that they could be deadly. But they were not dangerous in the sense of presenting a direct threat to the American-led global order. Russia and China, combined with chaos in the Middle East, absolutely can. And then we have this sort of Iranian-led Middle Eastern axis that Hamas is a part of, Hezbollah is a part of. You have militias in Iraq a part of. And so in theory, you could be dealing with a situation where you could have potential additional military conflict in Europe, attacks on Taiwan, chaos in the Middle East, and never forget that North Korea is hanging around out there, growing increasingly bellicose. So we are in a dangerous time, and this requires a very steady hand at the controls of American foreign policy. I am actually thankful that the Middle East has not spiraled more out of control than it has. There's a lot that's dangerous, but there's also dogs that haven't barked yet. There are things that haven't happened in part because actually there's been some shrewd diplomacy. There's been appropriate levels of military action to demonstrate that we have limits to the chaos that we'll tolerate. It's a difficult time, Russell. And there's just no way to sugarcoat it. We will be right back to talk about yet another scary thing. So let's see if French raises our blood pressures on this one. And we'll be right back in just a moment. <laughs> 
Welcome back to The Bulletin. Russell Moore with Nicole Martin and David French. We promised to raise your blood pressure some more. So let's talk about Kate Middleton. Was that really her in the photo? No. That's great. Yeah, I'm here I, for it. You I'm know, here for it. I am too. I am too. Oh, but I'm, st- I'm charged with keeping us on task and on script. And one of the most exciting things for me for most of my life, not so much in the past few years, but has been an election night. Sit up, you hear the returns coming in, and sometimes it's one of those Dewey defeats Truman kind of upsets from behind, and it's really exciting. We had an exciting election night recently in Russia, and shock of all shocks, Vladimir Putin won with 87.8% of the vote. Has there ever been a more politically astute and popular figure than Vladimir Putin. No one was surprised, of course, with the way that Russia is operating and has been operating for a long time. Most democratic countries have condemned this election again as unfair and undemocratic. He's poisoned his opponents. He's imprisoned his opponents. He's censored his opponents. And yet there he is again, apart from the immediate military threat of Ukraine. How much of this is just the way Russia's going to be? We haven't really seen a golden era of democratic flourishing in Russia. How much should we try to bring democratic life, at least long term, to Russia, if that's even possible? Oh, that is a Big question. So I would say the historical record for Russia is mostly grim and sporadically not. Russia, until 1917, was an imperial power, and it was an autocratic imperial power. Now, some of those autocrats were better than others, but we can't sugarcoat pre-Soviet Russian history. So if you look at the Russian Empire in 1914, if you look at a map of Europe in 1914, There are some things you will see and you will not see. You will see a Russian empire that is so large that it abuts straight up against the German empire. What do you not see? The country of Poland, the countries of Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, the country of Ukraine. Those countries didn't exist. They were all part of this large, immense, huge Russian empire. And when people look at Putin... I think it's a mistake to say that he wants to recreate the Soviet Union. He wants to recreate the Russian Empire because his view of the Russian Empire was Russia. And the Soviet Union, in his view, made mistakes. For example, he famously said before the invasion that the creation of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine was a mistake. It never should have happened. There never should have been an entity created called Ukraine that was different from this Russian empire. When you look at Putin, you really are looking at somebody who is much more czarist in many ways than Mm -hmm. Soviet. And the way you can tell that also is his embrace of religion. So the czars, by and large, embraced religion. And Putin has embraced religion. There's even John Schindler, former NSA, who's now a writer, has identified that even more than a decade ago, the FSB allowed an Orthodox parish to be put in its building. So the FSB is the successor to the KGB, Russian secret police. And Putin has framed his war with Ukraine and Putin's allies in explicitly religious terms. And in many ways, Putin is a Christian nationalist. And so he's in some ways connecting with a deeper, longer strain of Russian history than the Soviet Union. And I share your concern, Russell. There's not a lot of history of liberal democracy, of sort of enlightenment values in the positive sense. And the Russian army, by the way, has a long and grim record of brutality that precedes the Soviet Union. So I share your concerns, which is why one of the first priorities when you're thinking of Russia is defense. And then you can think about, okay, what about internal change, internal reform? Are there seeds of hope there? But the first priority is how can we prevent this sort of Russian imperialistic virus from spreading? You talk about raising blood pressure. There is nothing or very few things that can get my blood pressure raised as quickly 
as the Russian Orthodox Church. Because you have this, just take the theological stuff off the table for a minute. You've got this religious institution that has become almost an echo and a replay of what the book of Revelation describes in terms of the beast, of the kind of prophet that will stand there and say, behold, the beast who can fight against him. I'm not calling Vladimir Putin the Antichrist. I don't think he's competent enough for that, right. at least this point. But <laughs> but you have that kind of dynamic at work of this religion that has gone in and blessed all of these authoritarian, bloodthirsty, murderous actions. And it really is a picture of what Christian nationalism ultimately is. And at the same time, yeah. you look around and there'll be interviews with people at Trump rallies or other places. I'm willing to guess almost all of them would refer to themselves as evangelical Christians of some kind, cheering on Russia and I think a lot of people think that's a new sort of Trump era thing. I remember getting into a surprise debate with a major evangelical figure on Sunday morning news show in 2014 by saying Vladimir Putin stands up for family values and for traditional marriage. Yeah. And I'm sitting there saying, I, I just I brought my sons home from an orphanage where he's starving kids to death. And there's an abortion yeah. rate that's sky that's just unbelievably high in Russia. Where does that come from? Yeah, it's remarkable. And 2014, it's interesting you said the year 2014, because in 2014, that's the year, if I'm remembering correctly, when John Schindler wrote an essay that I remember to this day. It is not often that you remember essays yeah. for 10 years. <laughs> But this one was so prescient. It was called Putin's Vladimir Putin's Orthodox mm. Jihad. In other words, that Vladimir Putin was commandeering the Orthodox faith and commandeering sort of the place of Orthodox faith historically in Russian society and commandeering it to become essentially an adjunct to his military ambitions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's interesting about this whole dynamic is it shows for some Americans how much the internal enemy is much more prominent in their mind than the external enemy. So if you talk about Vladimir Putin, talk to somebody who's hardcore MAGA right wing, can't stand Ukraine, et cetera, they will go back time and again to Putin's anti-wokeness. Putin's military doesn't use pronouns. You've seen that kind of <laughs> rhetoric. Or Putin's Russia is not friendly to LGBT speech and expression. or And so Orban, you get a lot of this with Viktor Orban as well, and that it is this idea that, hey, these people share my grievances against my mm. domestic opponents. And so therefore, I'm going to view them somewhat favorably, even though he has launched a war of aggression that has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives and devastated thousands and thousands kidnapped of square kids. miles of Ukraine, kidnapped children, suppressed all other faiths other than Russian Orthodoxy. But he doesn't like trans rights, so they're going to have a soft spot in their heart for him. That is dark and bleak and morally yeah. depraved. And But yet that's where we are. Not to mention that Putin has gone on record saying that he prefers Biden over Trump. What do we make of that? I, I read that article and I thought to myself, and now we see the small logs that will build to the big fire of a, quote, stolen election should Biden get reelected, because now it was Russia's fault, yeah, no. not he, for us, but against us. What do you do with that? Uh, he's trolling. This is, you yeah. know what they actually think by what they say on Russian state TV. And Russian state TV is a cheering for Trump as recently as last night. And for obvious reasons, because you have somebody at least hinting very strongly Ukrainian aid done if he's elected. Yeah. And more than that, NATO is potentially done. I worry that even just the fact that we have this presidential election hanging out over us right now might be very dangerous to even just the will of people to fight in the meantime. One thing, okay, are we ready for the blood pressure raising moment? Okay, let's It's go. already high. Go for it. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, okay. So let's just go to the next level. Let's take it to 11. So the Institute for the Study of War yesterday put out its – it has a daily sort of campaign update, war update from Ukraine where it tracks Russian progress, Ukrainian counterattacks. It's really incredibly valuable if you're interested. But – what the Institute for Study of War said, there are now indications that Russia is preparing for large-scale conventional conflict with NATO. Mm. And now you might say, what on earth? How could Russia be preparing for large-scale conventional conflict with NATO when its military is bleeding to death in eastern Ukraine? And the answer to that is complex because they didn't say it was imminent. It's not imminent. But Russia, while it's losing a lot of advanced equipment, is bulking up its military massively. It is conscripting people by the hundreds of thousands. It is continuing to try to modernize its weaponry and its armament. It's interesting. It is not deploying its most advanced main battle tank to eastern Ukraine. They're being held out of the fighting, which is fascinating, at least so far. But the argument is that what Russia is doing here is essentially believes it has now the upper hand in Ukraine. So it believes that it has the momentum. It believes that it can see victory. And then also the idea that if victory occurs in Ukraine, it can only really occur because of a massive failure in the Western alliance, which is true. So if he is looking at a post-war situation where he has triumphed over Ukraine, either toppled the government entirely and now has a Russian stooge in place or reached a favorable, what he believes is a favorable settlement with Zelensky, where he gets to gobble off a big chunk of the country. Once he has that favorable settlement, it will only come after a collapse in Western support for Ukraine. That collapse in Western support for Ukraine will create divisions in the alliance that he is going to be prepared to exploit. One of the things that you have to do and it's very difficult for the Western mind to do this because our foreign policy discussions are always also influenced by law and morality. So when you have a debate about foreign policy in the Western liberal democracies, you're always going to have this sort of moral question hanging over that – or this sort of international legal question that says we in liberal democracies, we don't resolve – our disputes with each other by going to war with each other anymore. We have international courts, we have diplomacy, et cetera. And so it's almost in our DNA that we think about relationships between countries without thinking, okay, well, I'll just, I'm having trouble with this country, I'll just invade it and take it. But with Vladimir Putin, the moral calculus is just utterly different. And if he believes he can exploit a strategic weakness in, up, in his opponents, and it costs, oh, only about 100,000 lives, by golly, he'll do it. So for him, it's not morality, it's feasibility. And that's the same thing with the Chinese, which is why deterrence is so important. You hope you can persuade another nation to embrace liberal democratic values, but you don't count on it. So you have to create a situation in which in the grim calculus that Vladimir Putin engages in, he believes he'll come out on the losing side. You have to make him believe that he cannot win because you can't persuade him that it's a bad thing to invade another country. <laughs> Especially not when he has the patriarch of the church standing right next to him saying, this is all for Jesus. Yeah, exactly. You know, and one of the things that you – know, and David, you and I have been in these meetings a lot. You talk about raising blood pressure where someone will come in with scenarios of all kinds of ways that Putin could try to make mayhem in the United States in an election year, including in some really dramatically more serious ways than we've even seen so far. Problem is, it's not a Pearl Harbor, September 11th, let's all rally around the country thing. It's quite likely that a significant portion of the American population would side with Putin. I have thought a million times, how would this United States of America handle another 9-11? And I tend to think we would still see a rallying to some degree. We saw a very small rallying at the start of COVID, very small, but it did exist. It did happen. I think you would see a very real rallying, but on the day, on the very day, if there was a Pearl Harbor style attack against American interests, say China trying to take Taiwan or Russia charging into Estonia and American service members are killed and the president wants to invoke Article 5— 
you would on that day see serious vitriolic blowback online. The social media world would within minutes be on fire with finger point blame, et cetera, because we all see it whenever anything happens nationally or internationally. One of the very first things that happens on social media is how can we find a way to blame this on our partisan political opponent? That becomes the immediate priority. Hamas attacks Israel. Somehow mm -hmm. Joe Biden's at fault, right? Vladimir Putin attacks Ukraine. Somehow Joe Biden's at fault. We got to find the way that he's at fault. And that is an, such an instinct amongst so many people that we would not have a moment like on 9-11 where the entire House of Representatives gathered together and saying, God bless America. I really doubt something like that would happen. I'm always surprised at how images and video evoke emotion, positive or negative. I remember the picture that came out of Putin riding his horse and all of the reaction, you know. The existence of image has the ability to impact emotion, which really plays a role into the decisions that we make. So people who see an image of strength now have an emotional support, which then transitions into, well, of course, Putin is a, quote, strong leader. And it's just, it amazes me. Yeah, I just want to make a, make it very clear to Joe Biden and Donald Trump, we don't need you shirtless riding horses. <laughs> No. That's not the way no, to no, rally the no. country. No, we, we don't need that. <laughs> we don't no one need needs that. that. <laughs> it's interesting. The Russians are very bad at some things and very good at other things. So we learned outside of Kiev in 2022, they're very bad at rapid mobile armored combined arms warfare. That's not what the military is good at. But you know what Russia's always been really good at? Propaganda. Image making, messaging. And in the run-up to the war, think about how much before the shooting started, how much Russian propaganda had convinced a lot of people on the American right that the Russian military was an unstoppable juggernaut of masculine warrior virtue. So they had sold the American right that the Russians were real men and the Ukrainians were part of the weak, woke West. And then you had the Ukrainians just wrecked the first guards of tank army outside of Kiev and in eastern Ukraine. And all of a sudden, all of that Russian propagandizing was revealed to be propaganda. Now, that doesn't mean that the Russian military is weak. It meant that it had a terrible strategy and terrible execution at the start of the war. It has now gone back to the Russian way of war, the traditional Russian way of war, which is a meat grinder of a battlefield and trying to wear down and literally exhaust your enemy in a war of attrition, which is why American aid is so vital is – this is a contest of wills and resources now at this point. This isn't a blitzkrieg. It's a contest of wills and resources. And we have to be up to, it's our resources and Ukrainian will. And the Ukrainians have the will. They just need our resources. Well, Frencho, I'm a Baptist preacher and you have me ready for vodka. Don't drink that <laughs> Russian liquor, Russell. It's... Fight That's Russian great. vodka with Kentucky bourbon. Come on. <laughs> that equals well it all out. That's great. David French, <laughs> thanks for being with us this week. And Nicole and I will be right back to talk about uh, more uplifting things such as the Psalms. We'll be right back in just a minute. Welcome back to The Bulletin. We've talked about some really heavy stuff. Yes. And it would be nice to say, well, we're moving on to some light stuff, but we're not. We're moving on to the Psalms, which in many ways people assume to be light or fair because I think many people, when they think of the Psalms, they think of Psalm 23 and those kinds of places we go for comfort. The Psalms are a lot more complicated than that. And we have with us today somebody who has written quite a bit on the complexity of the Psalms, which is Fuller Seminary theologian David Taylor, who's been with us before. And to help us as we're moving toward Easter and you turn on the television or you pull up your phone and everything is conflict and chaos, it seems, how should we be thinking about the Psalms? David Taylor, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, sir. Good to be with y'all. Sometimes I will ask people, if you're on a desert island and you can only have five books of the Bible with you, what will they be? 
it's rare that somebody does not choose Psalms as one of the five. We're really unusual for somebody not to. I think there are a lot of people who like to go to the Psalms, but you've argued that sometimes we don't really understand what they are. What's confusing to people, do you think, about the Psalms? There's a heck of a lot that's confusing about the Psalms. (laughs) Some strange, seemingly idiosyncratic stuff, like there are wedding Psalms, Uh, that feel completely irrelevant to us, or coronation psalms. You know, we're a democratic republic, and we don't always know what to do with the royalty, monarchy business. (laughs) And, And then there's some significantly dark material, like Psalm 88, which ends in utter darkness. There's a lot of heavy, heavy feeling throughout the psalms. The vast majority of the psalms are psalms of lament, There's a fundamentally communally oriented nature to the Psalms, which sometimes cuts against the grain of a more individualistic approach that many of us evangelicals perhaps assume. And and maybe there's a, a tedious repetitiousness, like in Psalm 119. I think a lot of us who do not come from a family or ecclesial or liturgical tradition that a regular practice of reading the Psalms find ourselves dipping in and out of the Psalms. And it may or may not serve us. I think that's why I've done the work I've done on the Psalms, is to help people know how to access them more meaningfully. I'm a country music fan, so I'm accustomed to sad songs and love sad songs and love what might be called lyrics of lament. But I think there are a lot of people who have been shaped and formed by either popular music on the outside or by praise and worship music on the inside of the church, for whom that feels depressing. You know, why wouldn't you want to be uplifted? And then they come to the Psalms, and there are some, there are some really heavy, dark <laughs> Psalms there. I'm chuckling to myself because I remember a specific instance. I was sitting in a meeting with a bunch of clergy leaders, and someone opened the meeting with one of the Psalms. I can't remember which one it was. I want to say it was Psalm 137. But they said at the outset, okay, there are certain parts of this I'm going to skip over because it's a bit harsh. Seriously, (laughs) Psalm 137 ends when talking about Babylon, like happy is the one who who steals your children, kidnaps them, and dashes them against stones. So uh, I remember thinking to myself, What are the implications of a person choosing to stand before a group of people, Christians in this case, (laughs) read the scripture and say, I'm going to omit that part because it doesn't suit where we are today. David, to your point about the fullness of God's character, I think the listener can find a great deal of consolation when you listen in the context of the scripture. From my context, coming from the black church, the Psalms were always a great way to find ourselves as those who often historically felt like we're the underdogs to feel lifted by a God who will avenge you, who will not let you be put to shame, a God who will destroy and pursue your enemies, not your enemies in flesh and blood, but the enemy of enemies, to pursue the devil and destroy him. So I think there's a lot of consolation that can be found in that. I was just reading the other day, and I can't even remember who this was, who was talking about people who, when they see a baby crying, they immediately start making funny faces to try to stop. And they said, we assume that's because that person is wanting to comfort that baby. And sometimes that's the case, but usually it's more because the person doesn't want to deal with the emotions of the crying (laughs) baby. And so you distract it. And it, it seems that we think that's the way that we move ourselves through grief or through anger is by just pretending we're happy until it's over. And God seems to know better, not just from the Psalms, but the Abba cry and and elsewhere in Scripture, that we actually do need to go through this in a holy way rather than try to pretend we're dancing around it. I can't just assume like, I was raised in this kind of family, this kind of church, in this kind of culture. I know how to talk to God. It's the exact reverse. It's like the Psalms have to train us how to talk to God, how to encounter God rightly. And one of the things that the Psalms will tell us, it is a God who enters willingly into the pain and the trouble of the world. It is a God who willingly says, I can take it. All your questions that may seem 
impudent even, or disrespectful even, or faithless on the surface, I can handle it all. So the Psalms are giving voice to people in trouble, a people in pain, a people who find themselves at the very edges of sanity. And the Psalter is saying, this is not the boundaries of faith, this is the center of our faith. And I, I think we're not just missing out on something that would be nice as an additive to our faith. It's what forms us into the very character of Jesus Christ is entering into this space of the minor key of our faith, you know, as I guess the Psalms of Lamech could be described as. David, I actually really appreciated the article that you and David Bailey wrote around the murder of George Floyd. You used the Psalms in that case as a voice for yourselves. Like you found your voice in the Psalms. And I find that to be even powerful for my own life. I feel like each of the Psalms gives me permission to feel feelings that I know I feel, but haven't given myself permission to feel. What we've said so far, reading them out loud, I think that's good. And while I do not traditionally advocate for find a scripture that suits you, let it be clear, I do not advocate for that. I do think it's helpful to find psalms that suit the condition of your heart at that time, knowing that there may be a progression leading you through. And I also remember when I was first growing up in ministry, so to speak, I had an elder in our church tell me, you need to take the time to read through Psalm 119. Start with Psalm 119. Take every section, unpack it, and then go to the rest of the Psalms from there because Psalm 119 establishes and anchors you in the importance of the law and God's word and the meditation and the internalization of God's word. And from there, you might find the emotion of the Psalms. Years ago, there was an interview Krista Tippett did with one of your mentors, David, the late Eugene Peterson. He gave an example of a psalm that he would pray through every day. There's one for Monday, one for Tuesday, one for Wednesday. And I noticed what he did with that is he had the full range. And there was a psalm of lament. There was a psalm of anger. There was a psalm of joy. And he chose those out and went through them week by week. And I think a lot of times that's helpful to have the same passage that you're going over for an extended period of time to let it sink in. Do you find that helpful with people? Yeah. When I took a class with Eugene at Regent College, it was a class on, he titled it Biblical Spirituality, which was a vision for the Christian life from beginning to end of scripture. And yet at no point in the term did he ever give us advice, now do this. And I write about this in the book, but it was incredibly frustrating to me as a young man. I wanna know what to do. And so the last day of class at the very end, he was gonna leave us with nothing. So I, I raised my hand and asked him, give us something. <laughs> and, uh, and so he thought about it. And then his answer, I think, was a very ancient answer. It was, there was nothing novel about it. It was simply tomorrow, read Psalm 1, the next day, Psalm 2, next day, Psalm 3, get to the end, start over and do that for the rest of your life, which is, I think, the genius of the monastic tradition. They're just immersing themselves in this world of the Psalms that then informs their thinking and feeling and instincts. Suppose somebody wants to, who's not you know, engage much with the Psalms, but wants to take a Psalm during Holy Week and pray through it and think through it. And they're saying, can you give me a suggestion? What would you suggest? I'll answer this, but I'm going to slightly amend it. My okay. answer would be Psalm 22, because Psalm 22 shows up all throughout the Gospels, and it just shows up like a protagonist in the Passion of Christ. But I might recommend that we read Psalm 22 in conversation with Psalm 23, Psalm 24, because all three of them, they're like a, like a poetic triptych. And they take us in this narrative arc. And Psalm 22 takes us to the depths of individual pain. Psalm 23 brings us into this spacious place of care. And then Psalm 24 kind of explodes out onto this massive scene where God is sovereign over all things in heaven and on earth, over enemies and injustice and so on and so forth. I think what's helpful about that is it protects us from the possibility 
of a kind of a obsessing over lament or obsessing over pain or obsessing over the enemies or the injustice or the wrongs, which they're real and the Psalms help us to name them and therefore to make sense of the senseless. But I, I think to have those three in conversation with each other, it just positions us to be able to say, I'm going to go into the depths, but I'm not going to get stuck in the depths. I'm going to find myself carried up into a spacious place and then carried up into the sort of this cosmic vision of a sovereign God who is sovereign over the nations. He laughs <laughs> at the hubris of the nations and all shall be well. And then we can go back to Psalm 22 and, and go down and, and with Jesus because, of course, the Psalm 22 finds itself on his lips so often in his sufferings in the presence of God, in the company of God's people, all the broken, all the vulnerable, all the scariness of our lives is there. And God welcomes them as the shepherd that provides for us. And in faith, we say we shall not want. And we will be back next week. We'll see you then. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.